I'm referring to a kind of experience, a kind of, uh, shall we say, state of consciousness, which seems to be as prevalent among human beings as measles. It's something that simply happens. And we don't know why it happens, and although there are all sorts of techniques which claim to be able to promote it and which are more or less successful in doing so and sometimes rather less than more nevertheless there is this peculiar thing that happens to people and it's been recorded as far back in time as we have any recording at all and that is coming over people the peculiarly convincing sensation that their ordinary sense of individuality, of personal identity, is transcended. And the individual suddenly feels an experience that Actually, it could be described from a number of quite different points of view. But we could add up these dominant characteristics. That instead of the ordinary feeling that I as an individual confront a world that is foreign to me, that is not me, in this kind of experience, I find myself to be of one and the same nature or identity as the world outside me. In other words, I suddenly feel no longer a stranger in the world, but as if the external world were my own body. The next aspect of the feeling is even more difficult to assimilate to our ordinary practical intelligence but a very overwhelming feeling that everything that happens everything I have ever done everything anybody else has ever done was part of our harmonious design that there is no error at all and that's the sort of thing I'm referring to. Now, you see, I'm not talking about a philosophy. I'm not talking about a rationalization, some sort of theory that somebody cooked up in order to explain the world and make it seem a tolerable place to live in. I'm talking about a rather whimsical, unpredictable experience that suddenly hits people. And it includes this element of feeling the total harmoniousness of everything. Now, I realize that those words can carry with them a sort of sentimental feeling, a sort of Pollyanna feeling. There are various religions in our society today which try to inculcate in you the belief that everything is a harmonious unity. You know, things like Christian science or the unity movement and so on. They want to, to make a kind of propaganda for one to believe and through believing to feel that everything is harmonious. Now, to my mind, that is a kind of pseudo-mysticism because it's an attempt to make the tail wag the dog. To make the the, con the, the, the effect produced the cause. Because this sensation of things being harmonious is somehow never brought about by insisting to yourself that that is so. Because when you do that, when you would say to yourself, uh, all things are light, all things are God, all things are beautiful, etc. Actually, by doing that, you're implying that they're not. Because you wouldn't be saying all this stuff uh, if you really knew it to be true. A 
So this thing, the, the sensation of a kind of universal harmony cannot come to us when it is sought when we look for it as something to be an escape from the way we actually feel or to compensate for the way we actually feel. It's a thing that comes out of the blue. And when it comes out of the blue, just like hiccups come out of the blue, or something like that, it's overwhelmingly convincing. <laughs> and it, it stands as, actually, the foundation for most of mankind's profound philosophical, mystical, metaphysical, and religious ideas. Someone, in other words, to whom this sort of thing has happened. And as I said before, it strikes us as measles may strike us. Someone to whom this sort of thing has happened can't restrain himself when it has happened, and he has to get up and tell everybody about it. And alas, he becomes the founder of a religion. <laughs> because people say, Look at that man, how happy he is. What conviction he has. He has no doubts. He seems to be sure in everything he does. You see, that's a wonderful thing about a great human being. He's like an animal or a flower. See, when a flower buds and the bud goes pop and opens, it has no hesitation or doubts about it. But when a young woman appears in society as a debutante, you know, she's not quite sure if she's going to come off and uh, she appears on the stage of society with some doubts in her mind. Therefore, all appearances of this kind are a rather sickly nature. <laughs> but when the bird sings, or the chicken's egg breaks, <coughs> the flower buds, there's no doubt about it at all, it comes forth. <coughs> And so in the same way when somebody has an experience of this kind, he just has to tell everybody about it. Because you see, he sees everybody around him looking dreadfully serious. Looking as if they had a problem. Looking as if the, the acts of living were extremely difficult. But from his standpoint, the person who's had this experience, he feels that they look funny, that they don't understand, that they, there isn't any problem at all. That he has seen, from where he stands, you see, that the meaning of being alive is just being alive. That is to say, I look at the color of your hair and the shape of your eyebrow, and I understand that that is the point. That's what we're all here for. And it's so plain, and it's so obvious, and so simple. And yet here is everybody rushing around in a great panic, as if it were necessary for them to achieve something beyond all that. And the funny thing is, they're not quite sure what it is. But they are devilishly intent upon it. After that thing. <clears throat> and so, to the person in the state of consciousness, which I call mystical, that all seems very weird, very absurd. But it's not something that you criticize in an unkindly way. You don't say, those damn fools those idiots, you say, it's such a pity that they don't see it. Because although they are going around in this wildly ignorant pursuit, one of the funny things about it is that they don't realize that there is a dimension, a sense in which their pursuit is magnificent. It's an, to give an obverse sense to the saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Turn that into its opposite. Uh, not forgive them, but give them a blessing, because they don't know what they do. Give them an honor. In other words, 
the intensely serious preoccupations and anxieties of mankind appear from this standpoint not to be foolishness but to be a kind of marvel in the same way perhaps as you could say that the protective coloring of a butterfly who has somehow contrived to make its wings look like enormous eyes so that when a bird who is about to devour this beast is confronted by these staring eyes the bird is a little hesitating as when you stare at somebody they're always taken a little bit aback and so the butterfly appears to stare at the bird and perhaps you see this phenomenon of the marvelous staring wings of the butterfly is in some way a result of anxiety the anxiety to survive all the problems and struggles of natural selection nevertheless in this intense struggle we are unknowing poets you see one of the greatest ideas in the world that has ever been produced is for my thinking the Hindu idea that the world is a drama in which the central and supreme self behind all existence gets lost and involved and pretends plays that he or it or he she or whatever you want to call it is all the creatures that there are and gets totally involved and thus you see the more involved the more anxious the more finite the more limited the infinite manages to feel itself to be the greater the artistry the greater the depth of the illusion which is created for you see all art is in a way illusion the art of the magician is the art of illusion the art of misdirecting attention so that a magic seems to appear and so in this way the more there is anxiety the more there is uncertainty to that degree the play has succeeded in the same way as when you are watching an actual play or reading a novel or a movie the more the author or the actors manage to grip you and to persuade you just for a moment that you are actually involved in reality the more they have succeeded as artists you may have a faint recognition in the back of your mind that this is after all only a play when you sit on the edge of your seat and you're sweating and your hands clutch the arms of the chair and the scene so grips you that is magnificent acting and so the Hindus feel that the whole arrangement of the cosmos is something exactly like that but when in the reality of actual life you are sweating it out and you're wondering whether this surgeon who's got to operate on you in a matter of life and death is a competent man or a charlatan or whether the investment that you made is a good thing or whether it's going to make you lose your shirt you see all those matters of terrific crisis are exactly the same as when you're sitting in the theater sweating it out there but now a far more convincing theater has been arranged because as the Hindus would say that in you which is it 
the basis of you the thing that is real in you and that connects you under the surface with every other being that is alive this is the player of the parts this is the maker of the illusion this is the player of the game which has got you involved in this mess and is living it up in the same way as those actors on the stage are living it up to convince you that this is a real situation and this is very understandable because basically everybody loves to play this game the game of hide and seek the game of scaring oneself uh, running up behind yourself in the dark and saying boom all children like to do this and this is the most human thing that's why we go to the play to the movie and why we read novels and our so-called real life is from the position of the mystic an extension of the same thing because you see he is the person who suddenly has realized that the game is a game and that behind all you see if the game is hide and seek or if the game is lost and found everything to do with the hide side, the side or the lost side is connected with where we as individuals feel lonely impotent put down and so on all the, the negative side of existence I have tried to show you at various times that there's really one simple principle that underlies everything and it's so simple it's funny the principle is all insides have outsides because you see you don't know that the inside is inside unless there's an outside and you don't know that the outside is outside unless there's an inside okay <coughs> then you as you ordinarily feel yourself are the inside <coughs> you are the animate sensitive being inside the skin but the inside of the skin goes with the outside of the skin if there weren't the outside of the skin there wouldn't be no inside and the outside of the skin is the whole darn cosmos galaxy beyond galaxy and everything you see and that goes with the outside in the same way that front goes with back so that if you wake up and understand that you find that the two are one and the same identity one and the same self one and the same life so that's the mystic's point of view he finds that out now if I may switch what is morals in the sense in which I am using the term morality or morals it's a set of rules analogous to the rules of language now it's perfectly obvious isn't it that we can talk to each other in English only if there is mutual agreement among ourselves as to how to use the language what words refer to what experiences and what ways of stringing words together to be meaningful are to be used and it's very much of interest that we don't have too much trouble in coming to this agreement about language we don't find that the police have to enforce grammar the school teacher yes uh, for little children the school teacher does sometimes have to enforce grammar and say in an authoritative way and in the old-fashioned schools with the aid of some uh, implement of corporal punishment that uh, you know you use the correct grammatical forms but when we grow up into adult life we use these grammatical forms without much difficulty 
and very rarely do the police have to enforce it. <laughs> but it is otherwise with other arrangements that we have to make in common. Because just as we have to agree in order to communicate about language, we have to agree about, say, the rules of driving on the highway, the rules of doing business, the rules of doing banking, and so on and so on, the rules of family uh, arrangements and whatnot. And these are actually rules of the same kind as the rules of grammar. But alas, this is not very often recognized because the authority, the sanctions, the power behind these rules is different from the authority behind grammar. What I mean is this. If you transgress the rules of grammar, people will shrug their shoulders and say, well, he doesn't make sense. They won't summon the police. But if you transgress the rules of driving on the highway, or the rules of uh, finances, someone is likely to summon the police. And so one sees the authority of the state as standing behind those rules. And there are other rules where our society sees standing behind them not the authority of the state but the authority of the Lord God Almighty. So that if you transgress those rules you're in danger not simply of going to jail but according to your religious persuasion of frying forever in hell or on the other hand of failing lamentably to be a real person. <coughs> now, the problem is this. Where the, 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 the domain of mysticism and the domain of morals come into conflict. You see, throughout the all-known history of religion, the mystics have been suspect. Insofar as religions have been the upholders of moral rules, the, as it were, the guardians, the authorities, in the same way, for example, as the lexicographers of the grammarians guard the rules of grammar and expound upon them, so in the same way the priesthoods and the lawyers guard the rules of social behavior. <clears throat> but when into the domain of religion there appears the mystical experience, then the priests are very, very disturbed. Now you all know that in recent months in, the, in California there has been a very strange outbreak in the most respectable of all churches, the Episcopal Church. Uh, Various congregations of the Episcopal Church have had a phenomenon called glossolalia. And this means speaking with tongues. Uh, if you will turn on your radio to any Negro uh, revival meeting on a Sunday night, you will hear glossolalia. That is to say, when the preacher starts talking sensibly, but the congregation gets more and more enthusiastic and says, I hear you. Amen. Yes, Lord, and so on. And it works out the preacher so that by the time he's through, he's not talking sense anymore. He's just lulling. He's going through glorious nonsense. In other words, he's become a, all the, the dry theological categories have turned into not only poetry, but beyond poetry, into music. And he's just saying, You see, he's just going like that. <laughs> and the congregation's behind him, and uh, it's wonderful. <laughs> you see, he's become at that moment one in spirit with the universe, because that's what the stars are doing. The stars and us, the galaxies, they're not making sense. See? They're making a colossal display of fireworks in the sky. 
See, they're going like that. <laughs> well, it so happened that in recent months, uh, various congregations of the Episcopal Church had outbreaks of this. The Bishop of California, when all this happened, Bishop Pike wrote an encyclical letter to his pastors and said, with all due regard for everything, you know, uh, we, we, we must not be too dogmatic. We must recognize always that the Spirit of God may work in mysterious ways that uh, cannot be foreseen. And uh, we should keep an open mind about all these matters. This was said in a very complicated way for several pages. <laughs> but then finally, when it came to speaking with tongues, in effect, this must not happen in the Episcopal Church. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in effect, this is what was said. It was said, uh, you know, the iron hand was in a velvet glove. But this mustn't happen. Now you see this is characteristically, through the ages, being the attitude of priesthoods, of the guardians of law and order, or as they say in the Episcopal Church, everything should be done decently and in order. Uh, the guardians of this kind of thing have always been afraid of the spontaneous manifestations of the Spirit. And not only of things like mysticism, but also of things like falling in love. They are very, very dangerous happenings. And so here is an absolutely astounding paradox comes about. And it goes like this. We know on the one hand that human love is only genuine when it is felt in the depths of the heart. And we know that this is true whether it be the love of man or whether it be the love of God. We are always looking for the genuine article, you see. We, we don't want someone to love us because they're forcing it. We want them to love us because they really do in their heart. Now you see, when you go back to the study of um, the history of the Hebrew religion underlying the history of Christianity, you will find this problem in this way that you've got two traditions constantly compensating one against the other playing each other off in the history of the Hebrew religion the priestly tradition and the prophetic tradition the priesthood is always concerned with the external observance of the laws but the prophetic tradition is always concerned with do you really mean what you do? They constantly condemn as a hypocrite. And you see, in this sense, Jesus is the greatest of the prophets. They constantly condemn as a hypocrite the person who obeys the law without meaning it. Maybe this man does not commit adultery. But the prophet says, if he has looked at a woman to lust after her, he has already committed adultery in his heart. So that if you really obey the law, you obey it with your feelings and not just outwardly. For as Jeremiah says, the day will come when no man shall any more say to his brother, no God, that is to say, no the law of God. But they shall all know me, for I will write my law in their inward parts. The ideal, in other words, is people who do not simply obey and do the right things, but who want to do the right things, whose desires are transformed. For the heart, to write the law in the heart, means uh, to change one's desire. So you see, 
what this comes to then is a, 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 a peculiarly paradoxical situation that you are, de- you are required by law to be completely honest. And more than that, you are required by law to be loving and honestly loving. You must love God and love your neighbor honestly. Not forcing it, not pretending to it, not being a hypocrite. You must really feel it. Now that, you see, is where the astonishing conflict occurs between the mystic and the moralist. For the moralist knows that he has to be more than a legalist. He has to be more than one who insists that the outward observance of the law be kept to. Luther said that the law which requires that inward compliance is the most terrible thing. He uh, based a great deal of his philosophy on uh, an attack on the idea that one's own inner feeling could be commanded. Because you see, the moment you subscribe to the idea that your inner feeling should be commanded, you let yourself in completely for hypocrisy. If you see you tell another person that you love them because you know you're supposed to love them and in fact in your heart you don't love them you're a liar and therefore you, it, the more you insist on that lie, the more you feel it's your duty to make your feelings over and to love that other person, the more you get yourself deeper and deeper and deeper into trouble. Because here, if anywhere, the truth will out. You will not be able to sustain the, pre- the pretense. You will not have sufficient energy to go on pretending and making a kind of mock of the feeling of love. And you have at last then, if you're honest, to say, I don't. It it doesn't matter whether this is to some other human being or whether in a religious situation you have to sit back and look at the Lord and say, Lord, I don't love you. I think you're a bore. You're demanding, you're authoritarian, you're domineering. And probably I ought to love you, but I'm sorry I don't. (coughs) Now, we think, you see, that an honest expression of our feelings would be disruptive of law and order. It wouldn't. Not in the least. Uh, Actually, it would be contributive to it. Because if I say to somebody, look, I'm not doing this for you because I love you or because I like you. I'm doing it for you because the book says I must. Now that puts it up to the other person who has to look within himself and say, honestly, ought I to accept this favor from this person? Or ought I to go about seeing how I could provide myself with these conveniences? He may say, I understand you don't like doing this, but excuse me, I'm in a terrible jam. And I will uh, be most beholden to you if for a little while yet you will go against your feelings and help me out. See, that's a nice way of doing things. 
That's the kind of real understanding that we have to have. I was associated once with somebody in a business way who was a complicated person who pretended always that he was a great idealist. And that he was doing whatever he did for the benefit of mankind, for the furtherance of mutual understanding, for unselfishness and love between human beings. But actually his dealings were ethically of a very shady character. And uh, I couldn't get on with him because he wouldn't come clean. If he had said, look, <coughs> I'm in a kind of a jam. And in order to get around this problem, we have to manipulate things thus and so. And I know this isn't very ethical, but that's what we have to do. I would have said, well, I'm entirely in agreement with you. <laughs> <laughs> but then he wouldn't have come on with this sort of pious line that was so sickening and offensive. He would have come on in a human way and uh, we would have understood each other. You see, now, how real honesty is a, a, a genuine basis of morals. Real honesty is always not pretending that your feelings are other than they are. We know, as we deal with situations practically, that we may have to do things that go against our feelings. And it's the same with helping people when you have to, uh, whom you don't like, you don't want to help, but on the whole, uh, it's rather necessary to do so. But don't ever be dishonest in playing that your feelings are not what they are. Now, from this standpoint, we can perhaps understand something about the deep relationship between morals and mysticism. If we go back, you see, to the experience that I described as mystical, we see that it is the vision, I tried to put it fumblingly in the sense of the rightness the harmoniousness of everything that you are from one moment to another. That in other words, human behavior, its ups and its downs, is no different in principle from the behavior of the clouds or of the wind or of dancing flames in the fireplace. As you watch the pattern of the dancing flames, they never do anything vulgar. Their artistry is always perfect. Ultimately, it is the same with human beings. We are just as much a part of the natural order as flames in the fire or stars in the sky. But this is only apparent to the person who is honest in the sense in which I have spoken. In other words, the person who uh, is tied up with trying to pretend that his feelings are other than what they actually are. He can never see this. And he's always a troublemaker. He is the original hypocrite. The person who is unbelievably destructive is the person who pretends that he is a model of love and rectitude and justice. And in fact isn't. Because nobody really can be. But then superior altogether is what the kind of person I would call the loving cynic. 
who knows, of course, that everybody has his weakness and his price and so on, but isn't contemptuous for that reason. Incidentally, may I be so bold as to recommend a book, Memories, Dreams and Reflections by C.G. Jung, Jung's autobiography, the life story of a man who, in my opinion, was a superb human being in this particular sense of thoroughly knowing his own limitations and of having a certain humour about him. A man who understood how to integrate into his whole being the devil in himself and the monkey in himself. So then, in the metaphysical sphere, the mystic is the one who feels that everything that happens is in some way harmonious, is in some way right, is in some way an integral part of the universe. Now when we transplant or translate that into the moral sphere, the sphere of human conduct, the equivalent is this. There are no wrong feelings. There may be wrong actions in the sense of uh, actions contrary to the rules of human communication. But the way you feel towards other people, loving, hating, etc., etc., aren't any wrong feelings. And so to try and force one's feelings to be other than what they are is absurd and furthermore dishonest. But you see, the, the idea that there are no wrong feelings is an immensely threatening idea to people who are afraid to feel in any case. And this is one of the peculiar problems of our culture. That we are terrified of our feelings. Because they, they take off on their own. And we think that if we give them any scope, and if we don't immediately beat them down, they will lead us into all kinds of chaotic and destructive action. It's so funny that we, in our Western culture today, say that kind of thing. We who do more chaotic and reckless kind of action than anybody ever did. But if, for a change, we would allow our feelings and look upon their comings and goings as something as beautiful and as natural and necessary as changes in the weather, the going of night and day and of the four seasons. We would be at peace with ourselves because what is problematic for Western man is not so much his struggles with other people and their needs and their problems as his struggle with his own feelings with what he will allow himself to feel and what he won't allow himself to feel the, he's ashamed to feel really profoundly sad so much so that he could cry it is not manly to cry he is ashamed to loathe somebody because you are not supposed to hate people. He is ashamed to be so overcome with the beauty of something, whether it be a natural landscape 
or a member of the opposite sex, that he goes out of his mind with this duty. Because all that kind of thing is not being in control, old boy. Not kind of having your hand on the wheel. <laughs> but it is because, you see, we don't go with that. That we are not in control. That we try to pretend that our inner life is different. So I think this is the most releasing thing that anybody can possibly understand. That your inner feeling is never wrong. That's to say, what you feel, it's never wrong that you feel that way. It may not be a right guide to what you should do. In other words, if you feel that you hate someone intensely, it isn't necessarily the right way of dealing with that feeling to go out and cut his throat. But it is right that you should have the feeling of hating. Or of being sad. Or of what? Frightened. Terrified. Whatever it is. For you see, when a person comes to himself, he comes to be one with his own feeling. And that is the only way of being in a position to control it. It is in exactly this way that uh, the sailor always keeps the wind in his sails. Whether he wants to sail with the wind or whether he wants to sail against the wind, he always uses the wind. He never denies the wind. Well, in it's exactly that same sense that a person has to keep going with his own feeling. Whether he wants to act as the feeling obviously suggests or act in a different way, he has to keep the feeling with him because that's his own essential self. But when he attempts simply to sail against the wind, he's lost himself. He's become just a kind of empty uh, mask which hasn't got any real life behind it. And all its protestations of love and goodwill are hollow. So you see, it is in the most basic, simple situation. A mother has a child. She got it by accident. You know? And uh, she thinks, oh heavens, now I'm all tied up, full of responsibility and so on, I can't stand it. So I really didn't want to have it and I... Oh, 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 no, I mustn't think that thought. <laughs> All good mothers naturally love their babies. And so when she gets the baby, she says, Darling, I love you, but her milk is sour. <laughs> and the baby gets the other message. <laughs> and the baby's mixed up. And it would be much better if that mother said to the baby, Listen, you're a pest and you're a nuisance. And I didn't want to have you around. Well, then they understand each other. <laughs> and everything's clear. There's no confusion. There's nothing mixed up here. And two, when you feel somebody is a pest and a nuisance and you, you really let it go and you tell them so, you're apt in a while to get a sense of a kind of humorous feeling about it. That... Uh, you can begin from telling them that they're a, they're a damn nuisance and I, I, I wish you'd just disappear and get lost. After a while, you say, yeah, you old bastard. <laughs> you know, and it begins to have a kind of affectionate feeling to it. <laughs> To sum up, what 
the mystic primarily feels is the divinity, the glory of whatever is. And when we apply that to the moral sphere, what is, is what one feels genuinely. And this must always be admitted, always allowed. It doesn't mean to say, let me emphasize this, it doesn't mean that we always are therefore compelled to act upon the basis of what we feel. That is to say, the, to kill the person we hate. Hatred does not necessarily lead to violence. It is unacknowledged hatred that leads to violence. Honest hatred can be expressed in much simpler ways. But the expression, the recognition, the acceptance of what is honestly felt <coughs> is the moral equivalent 